middle April and it's snowing. The best meme I saw on Facebook today said, we thought it was April, but actually it's the 105th day of January. And boy, does it feel like that. And if you've been watching the news, well, it feels more and more like that. You're watching that 52 active volcanoes, volcanoes going off and creating great drama, earthquakes, tsunamis. You're talking about court packing and, and man, things seem to be really out of control. So it just seems as though when, when, when you find yourself in a spiritual winter, and I am in one right now as I sit, because I, I don't know the outcome of any of this, and there are so many questions. I'm in a time in my life when I've never been more unsure about the future. The only surety that I have is that Jesus Christ will be walking with me when things happen. But today I posted on Facebook a meme that said to trust God in the light is nothing. But trust him in the dark, that is faith. C.W. Spurgeon said that. And I got to thinking about it. Because walking in the dark is hard. Because when you can't see, you clamor to find anything to hold on to. But the thing is, is that's your actions and your movements and your IQ and in your will to get yourself in a place where you think you have some control. But that's not what God wants us to be. And so as I'm, I'm dealing with all kinds of questions, all kinds of decisions, decisions that are coming, all kinds of hardships, my heart breaks, not because of what's happening, because it just confirms what the Bible says about the end. And that means that my Lord will come and take us in the rapture soon enough. I am excited about that, and it brings me great hope and joy. But joy and happiness are not the same thing. Happiness is always driven by situational issues. And I'm sitting, in a, I'm sitting in a place I'm not happy, but I'm full of joy because of Jesus. And I'm watching the news and I'm watching my heart breaks for law enforcement right now. It's been a tough week. And we're seemingly in a winter, in a darkness, a winter that seemingly is lasting forever as it's continually snowing in a time that, well, it's kind of weird. So I sat down to do all of my daily devotional stuff this morning, and wouldn't you know that post about being in the dark, my reading in A.W. Tozier and in Oswald Chambers, and the Lord's given to me chapter 3 in Philippians all talks about the same thing, finding yourself in Christ and not in your own power, because only in Christ can we find ourselves victorious and where we're going. We can't do it on our own. Paul talks about it and everybody else does. A.W. Tozier says this because we, we so want to be in control of ourselves. When you're in the dark and you're reaching out for things to, to steady yourself so you don't bump into something, not listening for Jesus's voice, but clamoring to find the map, your own map, your own will, we find ourselves in trouble because we can't do it all together. Tosher says this, we also want to keep some authority for ourselves. We cannot agree that the final key to our lives should be turned over to Jesus Christ. Brethren, we want to be dual controls. Let the Lord run it, but keep a hand on the controls just in case the Lord should fall, just in case the Lord should fail. Now, I heard a number of years ago, what is it that we truly, how, where is the faith in that? How should we see all of this come to pass? Well, uh, I, it, was, it was put to me in this way. If you're playing roulette, you must push all your chips and put it on Jesus so that if he were to fail, so would you. Now, we know he's not because the Bible promises that Jesus will never fail us. He'll never leave us or forsake us. The end from the beginning and the prophecies and all this stuff. We know he wins. We know that the last verse in the Bible says that we, Jesus Christ, and those of us who have gone into him, win. So we need to give everything to him. He has to have all of the controls. And if we fail to do that, if we fail to give him control, well, we're going to find ourselves in places that are not so comfortable. 
Tozer continues, so we talk a lot about the deeper life and spiritual victory and becoming dead to ourselves. We talk about those things. We like to be Christianese and use Christian words and walk around and say that we're doing all these things, but we stay very busy rescuing ourselves from the cross. That, again, is his work. Remember back a couple of, maybe a video ago when we were talking about the man on the cross, the two the two thieves that were with Jesus. Remember that one man that says, oh, if you're the Messiah, get yourself down. Get yourself down and take us down while you're at it if you're so powerful, if you're the son of God. Remember the other guy's like, God, don't you understand? See, the guy that gave his life to Jesus gave up his life to Jesus, understanding that he, he was on the cross because he deserved it and that only by mercy and grace could Jesus bring him into the into the awesome paradise that he promises him in that statement. The other guy, though, is still trying to do it on his own. He's telling Jesus to do it on his own. Jesus, if you're who you say you are, get yourself down off the cross. But the problem is, is that takes into complete consideration that Jesus is in control of what he's doing, and he's not. We remember in the in Gethsemane that he prayed that G, that God would take the the cross away from him. But when but when he didn't, when God didn't go to Jesus and say okay, Jesus had to relent to what God wanted him to do, which was give himself over to the cross. We can't get ourselves down. That becomes our own work and our own will. The Bible clearly says we need to die to ourselves. We need to humble ourselves. We need to give ourselves to Jesus. Because in that time, when we fully give ourselves to Jesus, he can work in us in mighty ways. Tozer continues, people will pray and ask God to be filled by the Spirit. But all the while, there is that strange ingenuity that that contradiction within which presents our wills from stirring to the point of letting God have his way. Those who live in this state of perpetual contradiction cannot be happy Christians. A man who is always on the cross, just piece by piece, cannot be happy in that process. It, meaning, meaning we need to put ourselves completely and fully up on the cross. We don't give ourselves to him. We don't give our will to him. We don't kill ourselves. We don't, we don't sacrifice ourselves is the really the, the straight term here. By allowing Jesus to crucify us with him. See, because he gave himself for us, we give ourselves to be associated with him. The minute you're trying to do it only a little piece at a time means that you're trying to live in the world and in Jesus at the same time. And a Christian cannot ride the fence. He will not be happy enough either way. Either he's too much in Christ to be in the wicked world or he's too much in the world to live fully for Christ. The fence on a Christian life will not work and you will fail to be happy. But he continues, but when that man takes his place on the cross with Jesus Christ once and for all, complete giving over to Christ and to God's will in your life, once and for all, and commands his spirit to God, lets, let, uh, and he lets go of everything and ceases to defend himself. Sure that he dies, but there is a resurrection that follows. He's saying that you're going to have to give yourself over to the things. Maybe you don't want those things. Maybe there are things that you're holding on to in your heart that bring you to a place that uh, you, wanna, you want them fully and understandably. You want them because God said, well, God said, I don't want you to have it, but you want it. Because in your flesh, it's something that brings you joy. And so here you are trying to crucify some things about yourself and not crucifying others. You have to give yourself wholly and completely to God. You can't look at yourself and your power and your strength and your IQ and all the money you have and everything you have. You can't look at that stuff as power. The Bible clearly says don't, look in, don't lean on your power, your horses, your army. Don't lean on your money. Don't lean on those things, but the power of God to deliver you from your trials, from the darkness. 
He is the light that sits in darkness. And when you're in darkness, you must find the light. Well, Paul moves on through, uh, as he's writing his, his letter to the Philippians, He's talking about the idea that he used to be a guy who used to lean on himself, but once he figured out what Jesus was about and what that meant to sacrifice himself on the cross to walk with and suffer with Jesus, that all that other stuff became nothing. It became worthless. Chapter 3, verse 1 of Philippians says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. That's to say that same thing with me as I put out these teachings to read the word, to give you the gospel over and over again, regardless of how many people watch them, wherever it goes, however it changes you. It's not tedious for me. It's safe for you. It's good for you to hear the things that I say. It's not tedious because God has put and grabbed a hold of me to do this work in a full and complete way. Not because I wanted to, but because he called me to do it. Verse 2, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. He's saying, rejoice in Christ, look for Christ's grace, and don't lean on your own flesh. Don't lean on your own strength, power, intelligence, whatever it is. You must put yourself on the cross completely and give your will, the will of your life over to God himself. Well, now Pete, now Paul goes into his pedigree to make a point about if there was anyone who could lean on his own flesh, who could lean on all that he had always done, it's him. And he's going to tell us what his pedigree is. So this is what his resume says. It says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. That means that he was circumcised because of God's law. He was seen as in the tribe of Benjamin, and he was an Israelite. So he was of the people of God. He was of the Benjamin. He was of the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew, and concerning the law, he was a Pharisee, which means he was a religious leader. Now, we need to know that to be a Pharisee or a Sadducee, you had to show incredible um, competence in the law of God when you were young, that you could memorize the entire Torah, the first five books of the Bible, that you could teach and understand and have a good grasp of the law of God. He was a Pharisee. So if there was anyone out there who who could talk about the fact that he was a righteous man, a righteous man, it would be him because he had been brought up and taught by the best in the law of God. It says he was a Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church. He was zealous because he persecuted and murdered Christians. He believed in other, in other places that he was doing God's will by killing Christians because he didn't understand that Jesus was the only way, the truth and the life. Concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, which is in law, blameless. That means he felt, he believed that based on the law that he taught, he was blameless. He was sinless. He knew the law. He followed the law. And therefore, he could get to heaven on his own, not believing that Jesus was sent for a good reason. But he wrote this letter after he met Jesus and after he became a, an apostle of Christ and after he understood this. And so he's going to explain how things changed in his life. Verse 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. That means I, all these things that were really good for me, all this stuff I had, the training I had, the knowledge I had, the understanding I had means nothing because the law of Christ... Be, by living for Christ in his will, all of that other stuff doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't fit the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, 
and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but what which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He says, look, I don't look at my righteousness based on the law anymore. That means the law, the stuff that I did, because that's my power and my will and my ingenuity and my IQ and my, I, no, 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 no. I don't see my righteousness based on that anymore. I see it by Christ's blood. I see it that because I was a sinner and understood that, that Jesus dying on the cross would leave me to a place where only by grace, through faith, I would be saved. And so much so, he wishes, he, here he is, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He wanted to suffer like Christ suffered, so that he would be resurrected as Christ was resurrected. Talk about a heart of a servant. And it drove him to write and teach and preach and suffer in Christ's name. Look, when you're in the darkness, when you're in the difficulty, when you're clamoring for an idea, don't look for something that steadies yourself in your own power. Your own righteousness is not seen, nor are you hidden from God in the darkness. Instead, you need to look for the light in the darkness and seek after his voice. Hear it. He will lead you and trust him. He continues, because of all of this, because Paul said, I, I give all of this stuff away, I move on to, to living my life fully for Christ, because as long as I suffer for Christ, I'll be resurrected for Christ, and therefore my eye and my heart and my mind will all be connected in the Spirit of Christ and will lead me to do the things He wants me to do, not me. It says, not that I have already attained it, or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which is which Christ Jesus has also laid a hold of me. He says, I am not perfect. I'm never going to be perfect this side of eternity. So I don't, I'm not claiming that I've made it. I still continue to learn and press on and struggle with sin and all these things. But Christ has laid a hold of me and I press on to do the things he wants me to do. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I, I don't look in the back anymore. Now I don't even worry about the what's happened in my back. I don't care how much value I've added to my life in the past. I don't care what I've done in the past or who I've helped in the past. I'm always fixed on the future and what he needs for me in the next moment. Living my life day to day, faith by faith, um, glory to glory is what it says. As we go from a glory to maybe a spiritual winter, things are difficult to the next glory. How do we stand over that gap? Well, we stand in the victory of Jesus Christ. So he's saying, I, I haven't apprehended it. I haven't gotten perfect. But these things I know, I press ahead, knowing that the prize of the upward calling of Jesus Christ, the calling he's put on my life, is the prize. And I seek it with zealousness and with fervor. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. Let us, who understand all of this, have the same mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. If you think I'm wrong, seek God and he will reveal this same truth to you. I, I only know that because he revealed it to me when I wasn't sure about the idea. Having given myself more and more every day to the Lord Jesus Christ and trying really hard to, to give over the control that I have built my whole life is a difficult task. I also want to reach out and steady myself on some piece of furniture in the dark so that I don't hurt myself instead of just trusting the voice of God. And that's all of these things I've been learning as I'm sitting at home kind of laid up, being taken off the field. God has done more work in my life now 
than he ever did when I was doing things for him, not understanding that it's not what I do, but who I am, where my heart is. Therefore, let us, as many understand that, he has brought that to a place. He's revealed it to me. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, those in, those uh, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things. He's talking about people who pretend to be Christians, but are doing it in their own mind, doing it for their own selfish gain, doing it for their, themselves and not for the glory of God. Those people will fall into Jesus when he says, when he said, many of you will say, Lord, Lord, I have done all these things in your name. I've cast out demons and I've saved people and done whatever. And Jesus will say, I never knew you. Be gone, sons of iniquity, and they will be cast into outer darkness. See, see, there's a difference between doing things in your heart that seem Christian but are not and doing things for the glory of God with the right motive. And so he's talking about these people who are doing it with the wrong motive. He, he opened the letter talking about people that were preaching the gospel, but they were doing it in a manner that was selfish ambition. We can't do that. Our minds and hearts must be set on doing things for the glory of God. Jesus will lead us in those times, and we must give our life to what he wants us to be. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. This is the end of this idea. When the rapture comes, he's speaking of the idea that this sick, injured, dying body will be replaced by a body of incorruption. If you have sought after the Lord and you have called upon his name and you have been saved, your soul and spirit have been regenerated into Christ. Our body is still in sin here on the sinful earth. Once the rapture happens, we will be given the third piece of our own trinity of being resurrected into a perfect body. Then our soul, mind, and spirit will all be regenerated and we will be incorruptible. That day I look forward to due to my pains and my sufferings and my injuries and my getting older and my creaky joints and all those things that remind me daily that I'm daily passing away. Well, to stop, to end this, uh, Oswald Chambers was talking about submitting to God's purpose, just as Paul was here. He says a Christian worker has to learn how to be God's man or woman of great worth and excellence in the midst of a multitude of meager and worthless things. Never protest by saying, if only I were elsewhere. All of God's people are ordinary people who have been made extraordinary by the purpose he has given them. Unless you have the right purpose intellectually in our minds and lovingly in our hearts, he will very quickly be diverted from being useful to God. We must give ourselves completely to God's will. Regardless of what you want to do in your own will, you got to give it to his will. I promise you that at the end, it's going to make a bunch of sense to you. <clears throat> he continues, quote, I chose you, Jesus quoting in John 15, 16. I chose you. Keep these words as a wonderful reminder in your theology. It is not that you have gotten God, but he has gotten you. God is at work bending, breaking, molding, and doing exactly as he chooses. And why is he doing it? He is doing it for only one purpose, that he may be able to say, this is my man and this is my woman. He will do with you what he never did before his call came to you, and he will do with you what he is not doing with other people. Let 
him have his way. See, as you're sitting in the darkness and in and, and the spiritual winter as it's snowing in April, but it's a good picture of the fact that we are all seeds and it's possible we have been planted for such a time to bear in spring. But, but seeds sit under the soil and under the snow in winter. Snow has its reasons. Fertilizer manure has its reasons. And although it smells bad and it is not a and it's cold and hard and difficult and it covers us up. It has its reasons. And in the midst of spring, when we sprout and we come through and we bear fruit, God has a plan. The problem is the plan cannot be your plan. Instead, your plan has to be to give over all of yourself to his plan. I promise you. It's going to work out in the end in a better way than you could have ever imagined. I have all these wishes and wants. I sit upstairs and I think about how I want it to go, how I want it to turn out, how fast I want to heal and where I want to go. But I don't know these things. And so I cannot put these things on God because God has a different, most likely a different will for me, or he wouldn't have allowed me to get hurt in the first place or whatever. I don't want to limit God. If God wants me back doing what I've been doing, then so be it, and I will gladly pin my badge on again. But if he doesn't want me there due to other things, he's growing me in the ground, and I will come up a different person, a new creation. If I don't give it over to him, that won't happen. And instead, he will chastise and punish Because a good father does that to someone who's disobedient. He's called me to do these things, and I have to give it over to him. So many things in my past have not worked out for for myself, the things that I wanted to happen that never happened. And I didn't understand for so long why I had worked so hard for things that God never gave me. But then he opened my eyes, and he turned on the light. And the dark and the dark room I was standing in was very, very illuminated and was very different than I expected, and was far more marvelous than I could have ever imagined. Put yourself on the cross. Jesus says, if you want to follow me, take up your cross and follow me. You have to die to yourself. Die to your wants. Die to your wishes. Die to your sins. Die to your brokenness. And give it all to him. Because Jesus gave it all to you when he died on the cross to save your soul. Be blessed this week. Seek after the Lord. And be ready. Be good. Knowing the sun is coming. The snow is going to melt. And spring and summer are around the corner. Take care and be good and blessings.